I'm Callum Roberts. I'm professor of marine conservation at the University of York, and I'm author of Ocean of Life, How Our Seas Are Changing. A few years ago, in Upiat, hunters from the north slope of Alaska caught a bowhead whale. When they cut up its carcass, they found an iron harpoon point buried within its shoulder of a kind that hadn't been used for at least 100 years. It turned out that this whale was 130 years old. In the early 19th century, there were perhaps as many as 100,000 bowheads around the Bering Strait that separates America from Asia. The sea would have resounded to their calls as they went about the noisy business of life. Then, in 1848, a whaling boat penetrated these waters and slaughtered them like sheep. The bowhead is a docile creature and the killing was easy. Within the space of a single bowhead lifetime, the world of whales changed forever. Some of the backstory in this book is disheartening, and the picture gets worse looking forward if we blithely continue on the present course. But I'm hugely encouraged by the efforts of the last 10 years. People have really noticed the spread of human influence across and beneath the sea, and there are countless efforts underway to redress the harm. This is why I remain an optimist. We can change. We can turn around our impacts on our biosphere. We can live alongside wild nature. The alternative is self-destruction. This book covers a little bit on the exploitation of the sea, but it goes into much more detail on, on other processes such as um, different kinds of pollution, the obvious ones like uh, sewage pollution, oil pollution, and novel pollutants like noise underwater. And then, of course, there's a whole range of climate change di dimensions. So I wanted to understand the way these things all came together and to see the big picture for the first time, really, as to how the oceans were changing because of us. For the first 180,000 years of human history, there's been very little in terms of impact on the oceans. We ate seafood, uh, we, we have done since 140,000 years ago, according to remains found in caves in South Africa. But that was just tiny little scratches on, on, on the surface of a, an enormous abundance. What has happened though, is that with our increasing population um, and, the, and the huge surge in population that we've seen really in the last 100 years or so, is that the the, uh, the scale and extent and depth of our influences has been accelerating. In 1889, in England and Wales, we landed five times more fish than we do today. And that was from mostly sail trawlers. I mean, that's incredible. And when you correct the time series for the amount of fishing power expended, we find it 17 times harder today to land the same amount of fish as we did in the late 19th century. So that gives us a much better sense of how much has been lost. Coral reefs are, are where I began my career as a marine biologist. I, I was a, a scuba diver first and then I got the chance to go and dive in the Red Sea. And at the time, reefs were stunning. They, they were simply alive with every form of life that you could ever think of. Coral reefs today are not the same as they were then. And, and that, that vividness, the, the beauty, the complexity of reefs is gradually being chipped away at. For many of us, I think we see coral reefs as, as being a harbinger of things to come as far as global change is concerned. They're certainly the ecosystem that has suffered the greatest losses to date. But I am optimistic because there has been enormous change in the amount of effort that's underway. The first changes that we need to do are in, in terms of changing the management of the oceans to bias time to get to grips with the, the overarching drivers of change. And those are human population growth and energy consumption uh, and the resulting greenhouse gases. So I see those as being problems that will take decades to come to grips with. And what we've got to do in the oceans is to give them the resilience that they need to see through these tough times ahead. I think it is a, a bit of a manifesto um, in that I don't want to write a book which is just all about problems. Uh, you could easily do that. You know, you could pluck a, a problem from here, a problem from there, put it all together and come up with a, an, oh my God, the world's going to hell and we're all going to die kind of book. But that, that's not very practical. And as a, a scientist, you want to offer some sort of uh, hope uh, and leadership and, uh, and a way out of the problems that we've created. And um, I, I think that that's what I wanted to distill in this book, was that there are solutions, there, there is hope, uh, and that's what I hope for it. So 
the nomination is wonderful because it will increase the, the, the book's presence and visibility, I hope. You know, by, by putting a steer right now, we can make a big change as to where we'll end up in 100 years from now. Whereas if we don't do anything, we're gonna, we know we're going to be in a bad place.